Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Just a quick word about today's uh, broadcast here. Um, I'm only going to be able to produce one video today. I'm presenting at a conference this evening, and I'm uh, given the time that I wait for the model runs to come out, and then when the conference starts, I just uh, won't have enough time to do it. So let's cover all of it, okay? At the end of this video, by the way, we're going to talk about um, what's going on over the next six weeks. We're also going to look out there at what's going on with La Nina, take even a look out at winter. We're going to talk about both North and South America, so i got a lot coming toward you. But the first image you've been looking at here, this was, um, of course, yesterday when we saw Hurricane Ida uh, make landfall here. Powerful Category 4 strength hurricane. There were some gusts. Now, this is not sustained winds, but some gusts over 170 miles an hour. Now, in this particular image, this is a radar reflectivity image, so the colors tell you the intensity of the precipitation. And uh, as you think about this, I just want to show you, this is what the radar reflect, or excuse me, the radar radial velocity image looks like. In other words, when we use the Doppler effect uh, to measure um, the wind speed and direction. And just a quick note, why there's a line right here, okay, where the values are zero, is because that would be where the winds are perpendicular to the radar beam. So the radar beam leaves out like this, and the course spins around. So it can't measure a Doppler shift on a wind that's perpendicular to the beam. But if you look right in through here, we did have wind speeds still well over 115 miles an hour, even after this had been had spent several hours uh, on, on, on shore here, producing a lot of wind damage. Now, just thinking about that, I wanted to pull up the latest power outage data from poweroutage.us, and we still see here that across Louisiana, we have one, over a million people that are without power, and really primarily it was on the right-hand side of where that hurricane track went through. And there's another interesting thing I'd like to show you about this. Um, if you've never visited it before, it's from the USGS. It's called dashboard.waterdata.usgs.gov. It's a great way to check out a lot of information we have about stream flows all over uh, the country, every one that we have a gauge from the USGS. Well, I went down here uh, into Louisiana, and I pulled off this particular one. This would be the Mississippi River at, uh, forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, but Bell uh, Chase or Chess. Uh, but anyways, it is in uh, Louisiana. And what we found interesting about this was that the, the top graphic here is looking at cubic feet per second of drainage. And normally when it's draining here at about 300 to 350,000 cubic feet per second, we saw that as Ida came through, we actually had numbers that went below zero. So you looked right down here, uh, these numbers were actually around minus 40 to minus 50 cubic feet per second. What that means is the winds were blowing the Mississippi River here um, back upstream. So we stopped the drainage, and you can see how that piled up the water at the gauge. And then, of course, once the winds let go, it, it let that water discharge back out. But it's been a long time since I've seen something like that happen. Now, there's no way that in my videos I can kind of compete with, you know, the, the, the national news agencies and all of the video footage that they show of this. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of it. But just one thing I wanted to show you from my Twitter feed, this particular video just caught my attention. We are in, um, you know, downtown New Orleans. This, I believe, is the Central Business District. And just amazing to see this, the sheets of water coming off on the side of this building as we're pounding it with the wind and rain from what is an incredibly powerful hurricane. Just something to remember here, this part of Louisiana was hit five times last year, and now we're going after it again this year with one of the most powerful tropical cyclones, honestly, in U.S. history. So where it's going today, this is our latest radar animation. There's quite a few things to pick out here. We will lose some of the radar data around Ida, but the heaviest rains are on the eastern side of this, and we are expecting flooding from Mississippi and Alabama through Tennessee, Kentucky, through West Virginia, Virginia, all the way here into parts of Pennsylvania and the northeast, where we just had uh, a hurricane and, and then downgraded to tropical storm Henri hit recently. But you can see the frontal boundary that it's pushing up against and all the storms that are lined up on that frontal boundary here over the last about 12 hours or so. And we are going to be seeing more moisture coming up from a tropical system. We're barely catching the northern edge up, way down here in the Baja, that's going to be impactful in the Midwestern part of the United States coming up very, very soon. So how much precipitation have we added up? Well, this is through 3 p.m. Central Time today, and there's usually about a two-hour lag on this. That's just quality control. And what we notice here is that on the right-hand side of, of Ida, we had several locations that picked up um, you know, six to 12 plus inches of rainfall. I'm waiting on the official totals once the event is done, and I'll be sure to report that back to you. Now, I'm gonna come back to, in a few moments, all of the thunderstorm activity we've had in parts of the Western Corn Belt and into the East as well in just a few moments here. But one quick thing I wanted to point out, 
Again, one of my favorite resources, blitzertongue.org. Check out this website. You can catch a lot of the, the live lightning strikes. It's kind of funny for me. I had to fly out to Southern California for this conference, and my cell phone carrier didn't reset my location, which is why my alarms all went off two hours late. But uh, it kept telling me there was lightning nearby, and that's because I live right over here. And all morning long, when those storms were just south of where I live in Champaign, or actually Muhammad, Illinois, we had quite a bit of storms on that frontal boundary. Some of these are putting down some very, very heavy rainfall. So speaking about that rainfall, let's get a look here at our all-hazards weather map. And what we've got here is a broad area over which we have flood watches. All right, And this is going to extend uh, through the remainder of, of this week as Ida kind of rolls right through this area. The remnants of Ida move right through here, dumping a lot of rainfall. We also have flood watches over parts of Arizona. And again, that's where Nora is coming up like this, so the remnants of Nora. And the moisture for that will spread into possibly through Wyoming, Colorado, into South Dakota, Nebraska. And then this is all red flag warning in these areas here. And that's because we've got some very strong winds in those areas. Uh, and we're blowing that wildfire smoke uh, out of the west to the east. I'll show it to you in a few moments here. But let's come back to our total precip outlook. And what we're going to use here is the European Ensemble. This is the 12Z run. And we're looking at the probability through the next 10 days of grabbing another two, another two inches of rain. Okay, so we can actually see there are, are really three main pieces to this. This would be Ida. This would be on uh, the, the right-hand side of Nora, plus this is just our normal convective activity right here along the mountains of Mexico. And this is as it spreads here and meets up with the frontal boundary from a deeper low that's going through the Canadian prairie. So we're going to put down more rain across an area where in the last 7 to 10 days received a tremendous amount of rain after being dry for so very, very long. I'm going to step this up to what's the probability of getting four inches of rain. And that's why in through this area we have those flood watches out. And because we have a very high probability of, of producing uh, or receiving at least four inches of rain out of what is uh, left of, of once powerful Hurricane Ida. Now from there I'd like to show you total wind gusts. Let's blow this up a little bit and I'll, I'll kind of rock this back and forth. You see as we go back to the uh, 12Z forecast we're looking here at accumulated wind gusts. Now I know we're going to keep probably a closer eye right here on Ida, and we will continue to see those wind gusts upwards of 50 to maybe 60 miles an hour as, as what's left pushes through this section of the country. We're a lot calmer on the backside, as you see here. But some stronger winds in the plains throughout the rest of this week, and then also some really strong winds out here in the west. And I'll show you what those look like right now. You can see them running through the canyons between the mountains and around them here. These strong winds out of the west, plus these very strong winds just offshore, are what have really increased our, our threat here of, of, of spreading these wildfires. You can also very clearly see the circulation uh, from Ida here. So to just show you where that smoke is going, this is our vertically integrated smoke from uh, the HER, the High Resolution Rapid Refresh Model. And uh, we have a lot of fire danger in the west today as the winds are, are I mean, out of the west and they're very, very strong. So we see how much smoke we're blowing here across the country. By the way, I am working on a report to try to understand what the full impact of that smoke was. And when I do finish that, I'll be sure and, and share it with anybody that would like to see it. Now, I wanted to talk to you about the rains we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Because in addition to a lot of thunderstorm activity, watch all this. There was a stalled boundary here. We then had uh, Fred, Henri. And then we had the change in the pattern, which started to dip troughs into this area. When you look at this particular map, in fact, let me uh, take my drawings off there and shrink it up so you can see the color bar. Just to remember something. These numbers, this is 175 to 325% of normal rainfall over the last 14 days. And there are many locations in Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, getting into the Dakotas here, where we picked up from these troughs sweeping through uh, some places well over a foot of rainfall. Extremely heavy rains back here coming into the Northern Rockies and out into Montana as well. And this just really is going to, to be honest with you, when you go back and look at the precipitation statistics from this year, I will advise any meteorologist that's going to do this, do not look at this month by month because it will completely skew the statistics. We need to watch this as a rolling one-week window. That will help better assess how the precipitation impacted the crops grown in the midsection of the country. Please keep that in mind because very heavy rainfall has come through these areas quite late in the month. Now from there, let's see where this pattern is going. So let's expand this again. And I want you to see that we're not really changing things too much. Why not? Or what do I mean by Wednesday? Another deep trough rolls through this section of western Canada and the northwestern United States. And you can see that it breaks up like the others do and sending those waves toward the Hudson Bay. 
So by Friday, while we do have an expanding ridge here, we've brought through two systems in this area while we watch what's left of Ida make its way off the coast. But you can see coming out of the Gulf of Alaska, see this deep trough? There'll be very strong jet stream level winds here. Nothing is blocked in the Western Pacific, and that, of course, is, is upstream for the U.S. and Canada. So we get into early next weekend, and we just, well, there goes another one. See it there? Shoves that trough through, and here comes this one. In the middle of next week, we just are going to pay attention to how big this ridge becomes. And if things do get stacked up a bit here, maybe high, there's the high over a low, that could temporarily block this pattern, but I don't see it lasting for too long. And certainly over the Great Lakes, we got another trough coming through. So you know what this means. Flow comes in like this, it tends to be drier. We tend to have cooler conditions. And then on the up, the kind of upstream side, or excuse me, the downstream side, of it, we tend to get a lot of precipitation. And that's what I really want to kind of drive home about this. Now, thinking about the next few days, let's just go right here to what the Storm Prediction Center is on the lookout for today. And that is strong to severe storms into this area and also, of course, uh, on the uh, eastern side of, um, of Ida. But right into this area, let's go take a look at our high resolution model here. This would be the NAM. And we're going to play the 12Z run out. So let's get it to midday today, central time. So this is about 3 o'clock. So now we can see all those scattered storms we saw earlier. But what I'm going to be watching here is not only what's going on with Ida and the frontal boundary right through here, but the clusters of storms that will be coming out of uh, South Dakota late today and then also into Nebraska because the models, and I know we've discussed this and they continue to show it, want to kind of take that cluster of storms, run it right over like Lincoln to Omaha, see that area in through there, and possibly push a, a squall line down toward Kansas City. And I want to watch this very carefully because the models are suggesting that this is going to be an elevated system because it's pretty early in the morning we're bringing this through. And while they do often get a little bit too happy about convection and over convect and build these big squall lines, as of late we've actually seen a lot of that activity. So I'm going to have to watch it carefully. So let's go into Tuesday now. Here's Tuesday evening. And now you're starting to see the moisture coming up from Nora. And here, it's hard to see because it's off the map, is our next low. Ida, sheared apart. We expect that. And you can see all the different kind of bands coming around here and why we still have the risk for some of those strong to severe storms in this area. This is going to push some extremely heavy rainfall through Tennessee, Kentucky, up to the Ohio River and a little bit farther north of it. And as we play this on through the overnight hours on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday and eventually out here to Wednesday evening, this area in through here is expected to get a lot of rain. You saw the probabilities a few moments ago. I'm quite concerned about that. But here we are on Wednesday, and much of the moisture that you see here is kind of being wrung out of the atmosphere first from what was left of Nora, and there's a front that's tucked away into a low that goes way up into this part of Canada. And so we start putting that all together. We're talking about quite a bit of, of rainfall, possibly for the central plains. So let's go ahead and use the 12Z European model and add this up. Ready? So through Tuesday already, now getting out through Wednesday. Now let's go out to, let's stop it here Friday evening. I'm going to stop here. So Ida, and again, very concerned about the heavy rain potential here. The European model is way up there, 6 to 12 inches of rain in some places. So we're going to have to be very careful right in through this quadrant. This is some moisture from Nora, but also just coming up off of the mountains down here through Arizona where you have the flood watch. And then it kind of tag teams with this front from this low that's up into parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan. So we're going to keep an eye on this area for some heavier rainfall moving forward. So that's through uh, Friday night. Let's just take it on out through next weekend and into early next week. And you see we're not adding too much more to that pattern over that time period. So if we want to see these pieces in motion, let's just go to the uh, surface weather maps here every six hours. So we've already seen through, in fact, let's stop it right there. This is through the overnight hours tonight. See, the European sees that too. I think we got to watch that carefully. And Ida is on the way out like this. Ready? Wednesday morning, afternoon, and evening. Now, Ida will be here by Wednesday evening, producing tremendously heavy rain. The moisture pulling through the four corners, tail of the front here, wrapped up into a deeper low into Canada. That's exactly the pattern we were discussing, right? Scattered storms along the Gulf Coast. Playing this through Thursday, what we end up seeing here is that front gets dragged through parts of the upper Midwest and northern plains, and there's moisture there to work with. And it brings a lot of heavy rainfall into that area, potentially. Now, the front seems to lose its kind of cohesiveness as it gets into the weekend, but scattered storms as we go into a holiday weekend here 
and through this area, and possibly again on the back side through the Dakotas, an area that's been hit quite frequently as of late. If we just play this on through early next week, this is out there towards Sunday. Maybe the stalled out boundary sits right in through here, so we'll just look out on Sunday morning and afternoon for some storms there. But behind that, higher pressure builds in and, and some drier air. We're going to go take a look at those temperatures here in a few moments. As we look forward, though, by day 10, what's the pattern doing here? Well, we still have stronger jet stream flow coming toward you know, the Aleutian Islands. There's a trough here, which means the flow is going to dip a bit and then build up into a ridge in the west. So that's where the heat's going to rebuild first. But the broader trough over the east, this is going to give us cooler weather here, wetter weather on this side, drier weather on this side. Okay, that's where the drier weather comes in this time of year. So if we look out there at the week two time period, okay, what do we see? The moisture coming in here, moisture leaving there, but the drier conditions coming in like this. Now, you know, you look at this and go, well, why are the models, there doesn't seem to be any tropical systems coming through here. And the week two European isn't showing that either, but I'm going to tell us we need to stay on top of all of this because the Atlantic is still quite active. You got three other areas we're watching right now. In fact, let's do a quick refresh on this. I was going to say, I thought Ida was down to tropical depression now. So it's at 35 miles an hour, but take a look. <clears throat> we have tropical storm Kate. Kate's going to stay out in the open ocean. We have the next thing coming off of uh, Africa here, 90% chance of development. And we still have another piece here in the Caribbean that we're going to watch. Now, at this point, there's not strong evidence that this is going to get into the Bay of Campeche and take off. But I will be watching this very, very carefully over the next three to four days. The National Hurricane Center has given this a low probability as well. And we need to keep an eye on this system just to see where it makes it by the time we get to the end of this week and this weekend. So we'll leave it at that at this point, okay? So from here, let's take a look at what we had over the last week in terms of temperatures. Very hot, very humid, really gross air in through this area, while much cooler air on those troughs sweeping through the Canadian Prairie and Northern Plains have really sent the temperatures way down. And I understand that a lot of folks in this area are going to start seeing this cooler weather and start thinking, well, I mean, we're almost to September. we got to start talking about those first frost dates. But why don't we take a quick look at what the pattern's going to do? First temperatures, these were the high temperatures expected today. And honestly, we hit pretty darn close to most of these. If we go into tomorrow, it's going to be a hot one along the high plains here. But rain cooled air in place here. And remember that front straped right in through this region. That's why we got some cooler weather there. The northwest, the next trough drops through, and that's what cools things down here. And in Arizona, I mean, 88 Phoenix at the end of August, or the beginning of September. That's incredible. This is all uh, from the cloud cover we're expecting here from what's left from Nora. Hot in the plains, but watch what happens through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We start to bring in some of that cooler air north, but keep it pretty hot to the south through Missouri. All right, so that's looking out through your next seven days here from the National Digital Forecast Database. Let's just stretch it out a little farther out to day 10 with the um, European, 12 the European uh, uh, data. Remember, as that ridge rebuilds, the west goes back over hot, cooler weather downstream of it, heat will stay in the southern plains. That seems to be the way the pattern is, is really shaken down here. And, but remember, the pattern's open and moving, so I see that out by day 10 through 15, we kind of move that cooler air a bit farther to the east. And this is what the 12Z GFS ensemble looks like at that point. Okay, we've got these next several days covered here. I'd now like to just switch my discussion over to the longer term, and we'll talk South America, and we'll wrap this one up. So uh, first things first, newest ECMWF weeklies. These were just released a few moments ago. They've continued this trend of drier conditions as higher pressure builds into the southeast. Bermuda High seems to be shifting east, so we got to keep an eye on that. That means we're going to keep more wet weather running the periphery of that high pressure ring. That means we'll keep the Gulf open and possibly stormy in here. Now I know this is approaching harvest. This is September 12th to October 12th. We can also see the effect of the pattern change bringing in more moisture into the Pacific Northwest. That's probably more associated with La Nina. But what are we doing on the temperature side of it? During that same time period, we see this. We see overall mild conditions. So there's nothing at this point that has me really worried about a big Arctic outbreak early that could give us a risk of frost. But that remember, we can't see those things coming more than, you know, at most 10 to 12 days in advance. So I see this from the European uh, weeklies, and I start thinking about a few other things as they're changing. One, ocean temperatures, Atlantic first, still very warm. We're moving toward the peak of hurricane season on September 10th. 
I expect there to be a lot of activity. See the cool right in through there? That is the cold water trail left by Ida. But on the Pacific side, very warm in the North Pacific, but we're continuing to see signals of our developing La Nina. You can see the cooler water in here. And while the trade winds have slackened lately, a little bit, the Southern Oscillation Index is back there in neutral territory. I think it's gonna be a factor we're gonna watch develop as we get into October and November and December. And remember, all the long-range models do suggest that's going to happen. Now, with the help of a couple of my colleagues, Matt Reardon and Andrew Pritchard, we had a little discussion today about maybe we could pull off some analog years looking back at our, our, our Ocean Nino Index, which helps us understand those previous La Nina and El Nino patterns. So the La Ninas are the dips down, the El Ninos are the big spikes up. We often notice that La Ninas tend to be, I, I jokingly call them kind of double dippers. You get one in one winter, and then you get a, another one in the following winter. I expect the one this upcoming winter to be weaker than last winter. And so I selected a few years to try to do an analog. And interestingly enough, I found a pattern by using 11, 2011, 97, 09, 72, 2001, and 1985 as my analogs that suggest that this pattern coming up, see the big high there, is going to be very typical of a La Nina winter. Very typical of a La Nina winter. I mean, that's. If I could tell you what a La Nina winter looks like, even only I only use six analogs, these tend to suggest that we're going to see something like this. December, January, February, better chances of cold along the north interior of the U.S. And the precipitation pattern seems to look something like wet in the northwest, wet through the Ohio River Valley, active storm track, and drier along the southern U.S. That's very much a La Nina pattern. So I'm trying to provide some support for this because on next Monday's video, I'll have the brand new seasonal updates from the European. Remember, they come out once a month on the 5th, so I'll get them on Sunday. Those of you that are signed up for my newsletter, you'll get that on Sunday as well. From here, though, I'm now thinking about South America because we know that over the last 30 days, it's been dry, drier than normal, and we got to get the monsoon to start before planting can commence here. When we look out over the next 10 days, we see that while there's better rains north, and that includes the northern part of Mato Grosso, we're drier through a, most of the prime ground here from the southern half of Mato Grosso through Mato Grosso do Sol, Parana, and even down here to Sao Paulo. So that's a critical area that we got to return moisture to. Very wet in Argentina and Uruguay and Rio Grande do Sol. So thinking about this, the same time period, September 15 now to October 15, remember they can start planting on September 15, we do see that the models are trying to keep some sense of drier weather here, wetter to the east and wetter to the north. Do you see that? And that's going to be key because we're going to wait for those rains to come in to really revive that soil before planting will start. And what I was looking for was this. Using those same analog years, I was curious if drought often developed December, January, February, whenever we had the kind of second dip of a La Nina. Because we know we get our best rising motion here, right in like MJO regions four, five, maybe six. A lot of subsidence over the Pacific. But there's a suggestion that right in through here in the Amazon, we could get really good rising motion. Now, if that occurs, it makes me ask the question, do we get nearby subsidence from it that could promote drier conditions this upcoming growing season for South America? And I'm, I'm certainly going to be watching that extremely carefully in the coming days and weeks. So I'll report back to you what I find out, all right? And we'll keep going with this forecast. Thank you for letting me just produce one video today. You all have a great rest of your week, and I'll get back to my normal schedule on Thursday. Thanks.